Today we are joined with Dr. Parker Kelly. He's out in UCSF as a postdoc, expertise in psychoimmunology, biomedical sciences, and psychedelics. The goal of this interview is a thoughtful discussion on psychedelic science and medicine with an emphasis on the on caution or risks around these substances. We get pretty deep into the science today. If you're someone who's been listening in, maybe Joe Rogan or something, you know, you see on TikTok shorts, or you're reading about these these things and how they can really affect people this is an episode to kind of clear the air and get a sense of what the science is really saying about the substances ability to help people the cautions the risks all these types of things so i encourage everyone to stay curious and wherever you are today i hope you enjoy this episode of learn with lowell learning with lowell learning with lowell is not recorded in front of a live studio audience but we do take fan questions stay tuned and stay curious we were just talking off air and uh we're talking about parker's research and he suggested that we start with understanding the metabolics of uh, psychiatric illnesses and i think that's very interesting especially considering you're working some somewhat interested in mitochondria and mitochondria seems to just you know it's a powerhouse of many interests i, I would say as the as the joke so what where's the relationship there why is that so important yeah absolutely um so I, yeah, uh, just to begin, uh, there was a great paper that came out by Martin Picard at uh, Columbia recently um, called Mitochondrial Signal Transduction, uh, in which he proudly proclaimed that the mitochondria is not just the powerhouse of the cell, but is the information processor of the cell. Mm. Um, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, there's this kind of reframing uh, of cellular biology uh, going on, at least from that bioenergetic perspective, um, such that... Uh, you kind of look at the nucleus more as a library rather than uh, as the kind of brain or information processor. It turns out that the mitochondria not only produces energy, but it regulates the expression of nuclear and mitochondrial transcription factors that uh, kind of mediate uh, pretty much all cellular activity. And um, mitochondria, you know, they produce, uh, you know, the majority of, um, you know, energy and ATP uh, that, that cells make. And, energy is required for all biological activities. So it mm -hmm. seems quite intuitive that, you know, bioenergetic mediation of, of cellular biological activities are, should be, you know, the forefront of studying really any uh, disorder or disease, uh, but it's not currently done that way. And so we know that psychiatric disorders and, you know, just pathology uh, broadly, you know, is generally associated with this concept called uh, allostatic load, uh, where we, you know, can look at a bunch of different systems in the body, cholesterol, inflammation, things like HbA1c, uh, hypertension, you know, glucose homeostasis, things like that. And people with chronic disease, including, you know, myriad, maybe all of psychiatric disorders tend to have a higher allostatic load. And they may actually be, um, uh, kind of drivers of psychopathology and aging related disease and pathology generally. Uh, so people with hypertension or diabetes or, you know, cardiometabolic disorders are more, you know, appear to be more likely to develop psychiatric disorders and furthermore stress, um, kind of also drives things like chronic inflammation and hypertension and allostatic load associated uh, conditions. So we have all this evidence that psychiatric disorders are associated with kind of cardiometabolic disorders, chronic inflammatory disorders, allostatic load. So allostatic load is, is um, re really the, the, it's, you can calculate it. It's a cumulative uh, analysis of the load on the system from a bioenergetic perspective. So uh, if you think about elevated HbA1c or inflammatory markers like CRP, hypertension, high cholesterol. At any point in this conversation, if you find value in it, please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends. Uh, all of these uh, can be kind of uh, put into an analysis uh, that produces a kind of metric of the cumulative allostatic load on an individual. So people with, uh, you know, cardiovascular disease or diabetes uh, tend to have higher allostatic loads than the general yeah. population, higher levels of inflammation. Um, and the same thing is true for PTSD and depression, anxiety disorders, and even uh, schizophrenia. So all these disorders are associated with stress. Stress drives allostatic load. Um, 
in particular, like, you know, if you get stressed out, your inflammatory biomarkers go up acutely and chronic stress can lead to chronic, chronically elevated inflammatory biomarkers. And, and the conclusion here, the important part is that um, this effect may be bidirectional. So we know that stress can precipitate psychiatric disorders. Stress also induces elevated inflammation and these other sorts of factors. Um, and those sorts of factors may also predispose to psychiatric disorders. So if you have uh, diabetes or, you know, a high allostatic load, any of those factors I mentioned before, in addition to others, you may have higher chances of developing psychiatric disorders. And um, all of these factors, including allostatic load, uh, are mitochondrially uh, mediated or at least regulated in some sense. So, you know, there's this kind of cumulative evidence that, um, you know, metabolic factors and inflammatory factors, peripheral stress factors uh, have this kind of bi-directional relationship to psychopathology and psychiatric disease. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what a lot of my work is focused on. So if that's correct, what, what do you think psychedelics are doing that's have like, so most research that's come out is saying, you know, people say take psychedelics or MDMA, whatever, and it has some relationship to do having a positive relationship to affecting the illnesses. So if it's if it comes down to the metabolics of it all, what what are these uh, chemicals doing to people? Yeah, so that's a that's a very good question. Um, and uh, it has not been investigated very thoroughly yet. Uh, that pharmawaska paper uh, that, that I published in ACS Chemical Neuroscience, um, we investigated uh, something fairly novel, which is reactive oxygen species production uh, in the brain uh, before and after treatment. And, um, you know, we treated with uh, either DMT or harmaline, two of the active constituents of ayahuasca. Uh, they were synthetic chemicals, which is why we call them uh, pharmawaska or both of those drugs in combination. And what we saw was that DMT or the combination normalized reactive oxygen species production. So uh, reactive oxygen species are produced as a byproduct of normal metabolism or by the immune system uh, through a couple different pathways. And stress increases ROS production in the brain, as we previously showed in the model that we used. And, uh, you know, other research has shown that uh, PTSD may be associated with, you know, elevated oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, so in our paper, we found that, that you know, that these uh, metrics of cellular metabolism were uh, normalized by, um, by our treatment. Basically, um, you know, that, that's, uh, that was our initial finding and other work uh, by other labs has uh, kind of replicated some of that stuff, uh, not our finding particularly, but um, there was a, a lab, the Vidaya lab, um, that, that showed the treatment with um, uh, serotonin, which is a binds to the same receptor as, um, as serotonin psychedelics, the 5-HT2A receptor, uh, as well as um, uh, some other compounds. Uh, including a uh, psychedelic called DOI, uh, radically um, improved mitochondrial functional capacity in uh, neurons, both in a uh, dish, uh, so in vitro and in vivo, um, which was pretty impressive. They improved mitochondrial functional uh, efficiency and uh, increased ATP production. So it does seem like there are these, you know, 5-HT2A, which is the psychedelic receptor uh, mediated mitochondrial effects um, that kind of lean toward uh, improving mitochondrial efficiency. And one of, you know, the important things that we see after stress or especially chronic stress or traumatic stress in animal models and even in, you know, peripheral uh, measurements in, in humans is that mitochondrial efficiency uh, kind of goes down. So you can kind of think of mitochondrial efficiency as this, um, how much ATP or energy is produced relative to how much um, kind of deleterious or, or damaging byproducts are, are produced like reactive oxygen species. Um, so a kind of damaged mitochondria will produce more uh, kind of damaging ROS uh, relative to the amount of ATP that's produced. And it seems like mitochondria become less and less efficient because less energy is applied to repairing them uh, during, you know, conditions of chronic stress because chronic stress uh, requires a lot of energy and, you know, energy has to be kind of shunted in other directions uh, in order to, you know, maintain cellular integrity during that chronic stress. So kind of, even though the literature is, is very early on, uh, you know, we have some evidence to suggest that um, mitochondria or uh, psychedelics are actually directly inter interacting with uh, mitochondria or at least indirectly through um, kind of signal transduction pathways to change the way that the brain produces energy and, and shifts it into a, a more efficient kind of a energy production program. And this, this may also be true in the periphery. Uh, a lot of uh, 
I, I used to, uh, one of my, you know, wonderful graduate mentors was Charles Nichols at uh, LSU. And he has this, you know, incredible body of literature where he showed in a bunch of different uh, inflammation models, particularly in the lungs, that psychedelics have these extremely potent anti-inflammatory effects. Um, and a lot of the uh, deleterious effects of inflammation are mediated by ROS and uh, mitochondria also regulate inflammation. So, uh, you know, in addition to, to, to Chuck's work and uh, some work done by a group in Hungary, um, there is this kind of conversion evidence that psychedelics from different drug classes uh, have this capacity to kind of, uh, you know, protect uh, the cell from oxidative stress or, or reactive oxygen species production, normalize inflammation, uh, and, um, you know, protect uh, cells and particularly neurons from, from the effects of stress. So it seems like there's this uh, kind of convergent literature that's, uh, you know, really starting to suggest that, um, you know, maybe just like psychiatric disorders are associated with these kind of metabolic differences uh, or, or shifts in, in the way the metabolism works towards less efficient energy metabolism um, may be corrected by uh, agonists at the 5-HC2A receptor um, and, and perhaps other receptors that psychedelic drugs bind to as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's uh, currently the, the direction um, that, that I'm going. Is it, is it like a byproduct? It sounds like is it the is it a central pathway of what psychedelics do in the sense of like do you ha will you get to the point where you have to take psychedelics to have this effect or will you isolate the part of the molecule that allows it to have this effect on the mitochondria it's like like the plan so then you can focus it down and then reduce the likelihood that you'll have uh, the negative side effects that are known to have happened when you're taking psychedelics like is this is this pathway really like how big of a how big of I don't know how to phrase that question any differently, unfortunately. Like, how, how would, how does that like shape up? Yeah, for sure. That that's a really, really insightful question. Actually, um, I I think what you're asking is that um, are we trying to do medicinal chemistry on the, the molecule to determine like which epitopes mediate this kind of mitochondrial effect, and so we can isolate it and maybe produce yeah. non psychedelic psychedelics, or you know, is this essential to the effects of psychedelics, or is it a byproduct? Yes. Cool. Um, so. We, uh, the honest truth is we do not know the answer to that mm. question. Um, we actually don't, and this is something uh, that we may, we may also talk about, um, but we, we don't really know uh, the critical uh, pathways involved in the effects of psychedelics. We know that this 5-HC2A receptor is probably really important. Uh, we know that from uh, you know several different sources, uh, particularly studies in humans where they block the 2A receptor with uh, drugs like ketanserin, which is the 2A agonist, uh, and it it does seem to completely eliminate or you know predominantly eliminate the psychedelic effects in people. Um, so but we don't really know what happens downstream of that receptor. And there's even some evidence that other receptors may be crucial or maybe uh, you know highly involved in the therapeutic effects of psychedelics, uh, which would imply that maybe like you're saying that, um, you know, these different types of effects could be teased out. Um, but in, in regard to the mitochondria, that, that the DIA paper uh, was published in PNAS, uh, I think in 2019, um, did actually suggest that the mitochondrial effects are 2A uh, mediated because they also used a 2A blocker, I think two different ones, uh, and showed that the mitochondrial effects were um, able to be blocked uh, by just blocking 2A. So, um, you know, just to get a little bit into the weeds here, uh, when 2A is activated by uh, either serotonin or, you know, psychedelics or even, um, you know, non-psychedelic 2A agonists like lyceride, um, they activate a bunch of intracellular pathways. These are uh, things like um, uh, protein uh, phospholipase C, uh, which, which cleaves uh, kind of lipids, and, and that actually goes to two different pathways, IP3 and uh, DAG. And then there's also beta arrestin and, and other pathways that uh, like uh, pro, uh, phospholipase A also get activated. So there's all these different pathways that get activated. And um, Dave Nichols, uh, as well as some other investigators like Brian Roth have tried to tease apart these kind of uh, second messenger or signal transduction pathways to see how they differ from serotonin. Because we know that serotonin isn't uh, psychedelic, at least at reasonable doses. Uh, there's some evidence that you can give mass amounts of serotonin and it'll produce psychedelic type effects, at least in rodents. But um, but those uh, those investigations haven't really yielded a particular psychedelic pathway, and so um, yeah, we 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 know that psychedelics uh, 
induce uh, certain types of um, neuroplasticity. Uh, we know that psychedelics induce this uh, head twitch response, which is kind of the um, correlate that we use for psychedelic effects in mice or, or wet dog shakes is the correlate we use in rats. Uh, and we know that they produce these, you know, phenomenological effects in humans, but we, we don't really know, um, you know, which effects are, are mediated by which pathways and if they all mm -hmm. can, you know, be induced by 5-HT2A or not. So, so yeah, we're, it's, it's really, really not certain, but at, at the moment, um, we do know that other serotonin 5-HT2A five, uh, five uh, agonists uh, like uh, serotonin itself also modulate mitochondrial activity, but we're not really sure uh, the differences between psychedelics and, and serotonin itself. And, you know, the, the field's really very, very early, but we do think that this receptor seems to have this, uh, you know, incredible possibility to um, modulate the mitochondria in ways that seem to go in the opposite direction of chronic stress. Is it, it sounds really complicated. Well, uh, there's two thoughts I have. It's like how much money and how much time and how many different research projects do you have to because the thing that I think a lot of people don't uh, know about is when you're doing a research, whatever element of research, the re the it, it'll it'll seem pretty complicated, but you're really only studying one thing because you have to control all these variables so that when you study that one thing, when you see a change or elevation, whatever it is, uh, you actually can know that that it was meaningful. And so if this is a, a very complex pathway, I imagine it's going to take a lot of different studies, a lot of different trials to really work it all out. And so I have like kind of a two for like how much how much time and money would it take to really like work out these different pathways as they as they are right now? Yeah, it's a, a very good and practical question. Um, it would be very difficult to, uh, to, you know, determine that at the outset, mm -hmm. because um, sometimes experiments yield incredible results, and we're able to figure out a lot pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> but other times, uh, you know, it, it, it takes, you know, years to, or decades to, to kind of uh, whittle something down or, or, you know, we spend, you know, half a century on it and we still aren't able to figure it out. Oh. Um, but um, just in my estimation, um, there needs to be a lot more kind of in vitro and preclinical work to be able to, if we really want to be able to tease out these individual pathways. Um, and, you know, try to determine which, you know, epitopes of the drug or which structural features of the molecules are, are, are mediating these particular effects. Um, one thing I didn't mention is, is when drugs bind to receptors like 5 hc 2 a uh, which are called G-protein coupled receptors, um, there's this idea called functional selectivity, where the receptor is always kind of changing and moving uh, within the membrane. And then the drug, when it binds, selects a particular confirmation. And that confirmation is responsible for inducing a characteristic or particular uh, set of intracellular pathways. So if that is true, uh, then, you know, it, it, you would expect to be able to tease this apart in kind of more traditional ways. Um, but it's not even certain that, that, you know, that kind of functionally selective uh, differential activation of the receptor is really the difference uh, between psychedelics and, and serotonin. So um, it, it's, yeah, like I said, that there's a lot mm -hmm. of different uh, trails that we may need to uh, investigate in order to kind of get to the bottom of this. Um, but, you know, uh, there have been some like really phenomenal papers that have come out recently uh, that suggest completely alternative mechanisms that were published in great journals like Cell and Science. So, so yeah, it, it will take some time, um, but um, to really tease out the mechanisms. But you know, one thing that we are also working on in parallel is looking at uh, kind of clinical populations and whether or not uh, psychedelics just have this effect at all in humans. Um, and of course that will also take a little bit of mechanistic work, but it's a, it's a totally different uh, type of work than you would do in preclinical or in vitro work. Um, so uh, in that case, um, you know, we may be able to determine that it's happening uh, just by, you know, a few clinical trials in, you know, populations with mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, and if we can, you know, hmm. validate that this is actually happening in humans, um, you know, that will go a long way toward uh, developing therapeutics because a lot of people don't know, but the FDA doesn't actually care that we know how drugs work. Uh, there's mm -hmm. lots of drugs that we currently use uh, that we either don't know how they work or we know very little about how they work or like SSRIs, like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants. We thought we knew how they worked a bunch of different times, but people keep uh, kind of uh, upsetting the apple cart and uh, kind of 
you know, completely um, causing us to reevaluate our understanding of how they work. So uh, as long as we can prove that these drugs are safe and effective, they can be um, utilized uh, therapeutically once they go through the kind of FDA uh, approval process. So, so yeah, j- just, you know, because it's a difficult problem doesn't mean these can mm-hmm. be uh, effective therapeutics. Yeah. It's, a, it's interesting how often we, when it comes to science, I say we, but you know, it's you guys doing the hard work. The, how often it seems that it's just like a, the Phidias gauge approach, you know, like there's a, there's a guy in neuroscience, he got like the road stri- spike through his head and his personality changed. So it was like, oh, well, that's probably what the part of that brain modulates. And so it's like, uh, we might not know the underlying stuff, but from there you can do clinical trials, you know, like you're saying to, to, you know, directly see if this has an effect, like a mitochondria, like you were mentioning, which I, I just, I think it's kind of, uh, it's kind of interesting. I imagine like the most most people are like, no, they they know it all the way down to the you know the atoms and stuff like that, which is which I think is quite, kind of beautiful too. Like there's so much more to explore. There's so much more to see out there for scientists. For anyone listening, and they're like, oh, I'm really, uh, you know, anyone right now. There's always that that feeling, that fear, that when you see something that really strikes your feeling. And there's a lot of people who are getting really excited for psychedelics because of like for my excitement, it comes from the fact that. Like soldiers come back from war, they're having PTSD, and they deserve the best treatment. And the thing is, like, there's there's some treatments that work, but for, for some of them, they just nothing seems to help them. And there's these things that seem to really do something significant here. And I love that, and that's why I get excited about it. But I think sometimes people feel like they get excited about something, and then like they can't get into the wave to do something significant. But seem, like you're talking about something that might be decades of work, like a century of work ahead of us with the many different pathways to find your contribution to this field, which I think is awesome. I, you know, just as a little note there, but, um, so you mentioned SSR, SSRIs a minute ago and SSRIs in America, I think America is the number one place in the world for SSRIs. Um, do psychedelics have similar downsides to SSRIs in terms of people? I know like is for SSRIs, for instance, like sometimes they, um, I believe, you know, correct me, but I believe SSRIs at over a certain period of time, the, the the brain starts adapting to them. And so they stop working as effectively and people can have really bad side effects. It are psychedelics, do they have the same type of risks as SRIs? SSRIs? Yeah, that, that's a, another really great question. Um, and I, I wanted to say that I, I agree with you uh, regarding the, the Phineas Gage approach. There are all kinds of different approaches in, uh, in, in biology and medicine. And um, I would say most of our drugs were uh, discovered uh, or just therapies in general discovered coincidentally like mm-hmm. that. And sometimes um, I think for the most part, we have a very uh, kind of poor or just, you know, working understanding of a lot of the, the therapies we use. We, we don't really understand uh, well how a lot of these things work. And there's just, um, in, immense horizons in front of us. There's so much more science to do. We're not even close. So yeah, to all the listeners out there, we need a, uh, you know, smart, brilliant, motivated people uh, to, to help us out. Um, but uh, yeah, re- regarding your question about SSRIs, um, so SSRIs do have a, you know, a specific set of, um, you know, particularly difficult uh, side effects and they do build tolerance and they are uh, not addictive formally, but they, um, you can become pharmacologically uh, dependent upon them. And uh, they do have pretty severe withdrawals. If you've been on SSRIs for years, especially at the higher doses and you were to stop them cold turkey, uh, they're can be quite severe for people. Um, uh, psychedelics uh, are not typically, uh, I mean, none of the clinical trials that, uh, that, are, that are currently being used for uh, psychiatric conditions uh, use them uh, chronically. So it's usually one, two, or three doses, um, whereas SSRIs um, or, you know, most pharmaceutical antidepressants, you would be expected to take them every day. So, you know, of course your body will slowly adapt to any stimulus that is, uh, you know, chronically uh, given. And that, you know, actually may be responsible for some of the therapeutic effects. There are hypotheses that this uh, adaptation that happens after a few weeks is actually uh, responsible for producing the antidepressant effects. Um, But, you know, when, you know, chronically administered, uh, they can cause, you know, sexual dysfunction and, and, you know, there's a black box warning on a lot of us arise for increasing uh, thoughts of suicide in teens uh, and even in young people. So, you know, there are all these side effects of the SRIs, but they're typically associated with the chronic dosing um, hmm. rather than, you know, psychedelics where they're, you know, dosed 
you know, acutely like a single or, you know, just a few handful of doses. Um, but that doesn't mean that psychedelics don't have, uh, you know, adverse effects or, or, you know, the possibility of, of, you know, negative side effects. Um, there are, you know, lots of potential, uh, you know, things that can happen with psychedelics, uh, psychedelics may, um, uh, you know, in like, uh, kind of instigate the onset of things like uh, mania and people that are predisposed to bipolar disorder or other affective disorders. They can have kind of paradoxical effects uh, where people become more depressed. Uh, they can cause headache, uh, especially the day after dosing. Um, they can also, um, you know, lead to the instigation of, of psychosis and people that are predisposed. Now, a, a lot of those things haven't been, um, you know, studied to the extent in the same size populations as SSRIs. Um, so we're not really sure uh, how likely they are to, you know, instigate manic or psych uh, psychotic episodes and whether or not that's even uh, necessarily true, because most of the studies that have uh, gone on so far in psychedelics uh, haven't included populations that are predisposed to these disorders. Um, so so, you know, we know that there are some things that uh, seem to be contraindicated with psychedelics and that there are these uh, sets of side effects that can occur, but a lot more research will need to be done in order to, you know, really determine for sure in large populations, um, you know, who is likely to get these side effects and, um, you know, how common they, they really will be. And if people with predispositions really need to even worry about this, it may, it may not be the case. It's really hard to tell from epidemiological studies whether or not that effect is causal or correlative. Uh, but um, nonetheless, we need to be very careful. Uh, we don't have a ton of information on these things. And um, yeah, so yeah, more, more work needs to be done. But my intuition personally is that the side effects associated with SSRIs, those particular side effects are unlikely to develop from psychedelics because uh, the psychedelics are not dosed uh, chronically, but there may be other side effects. Yeah. So when I, when I, I haven't looked at the numbers at this, and so this is a feeling and I would love if you know the numbers, so this would be great. But when I think about the SSRIs in terms of like, if like if ten people were taking SSRI, I would assume as a feeling, like the way it sounds like when I'm reading about it or I'm looking into it. But they never like cite the numbers on these things. They would be like thirty percent of them are going to have some type of side effect, like that we've just mentioned. But when it comes to psychedelics, it feels like when I've talked to people, when I've had people come on, it it seems like it's more like like one in ten or less. Is when it comes to actual not error rate, but uh, side effects that are really you know bad. Uh, what are what are the like the population differences of the two? Are SSRIs more likely to have side effects of the type that is severe that we're talking about? And uh, how likely is it for psychedelics uh, at the stage that we are right now for someone to have one, some of these like psychosis related uh, side effects, like in terms of like overall population from what we've seen? Like what's the what's the chances of it? Mm, so I, I don't know those numbers off the mm. top of my head. I, I think um, you know it's fairly reasonable, uh, 30%, uh, of having, you know, some side effects, uh, with SSRIs, I actually think it may be just for having any side effects like sexual dysfunction mm. and, and things like that may be even higher, but don't, don't quote me on the particular numbers. Um, but severe side effects, um, I don't know if they're quite 30% in SSRIs. I think they're, they're lower than that. Um, mm. and, um, you know, the, the problem is that the, in, with SSRIs, these side effects persist. Um, whereas mm -hmm. with psychedelics, uh, I think you're right that the, the rates of side effects so far in the studies are quite low, uh, probably, you know, under 10% for severe side effects, certainly, because uh, maybe much, much lower than that, because um, most of the studies on psychedelics um, haven't reported a ton of, uh, of you know, severe adverse events. Um, I, I did read a study on ayahuasca recently where they meta-analyzed this stuff and there were... Um, very few, if any, uh, even in, uh, you know, several different trials across many different trials, other than uh, vomiting and amesis, which is already common with, uh, with ayahuasca, but they didn't really, uh, you know, paint a picture of um, there being a lot of long term side effects. And that doesn't seem to be the case uh, with um, psilocybin or LSD or these other psychedelics either. Um, although, um, you know, the I want to emphasize that the populations that are being studied in clinical trials are very well selected at this point. Mm. Because it, for the most part, we're only in phase one and two clinical trials other than I think MDMA uh, has, has performed some phase three trials and um, uh, MAPS has performed some phase three trials with MDMA. And uh, I think Compass is in phase three with psilocybin, um, which will include 
bigger, larger population. So we'll find out more uh, then. But um, yeah, a, as the research currently stands, it seems like the side effects, at least the long term severe side effects of psychedelics are far less. Um, although, you know, one important caveat is that um, people that have bad psychedelic experiences, uh, they can be very bad and very scary and can even be traumatic uh, for people. And um, when I visited uh, the Amazon and, uh, you know, kind of did did some of this work firsthand, uh, kind of looking at how, you know, people are, are dosed with uh, ayahuasca and these kind of traditional or semi-traditional healing centers uh, in, in the jungle, um, I did witness some, some very uh, severe experiences that were very difficult for, for people and, and, you know, you know, maybe even uh, conferred uh, trauma after that experience. But, um, but, you know, these, these experiences are exceedingly rare and people that tend to have bad trips, uh, especially in a therapeutic or ritual setting, you know, tend to say things like it was very difficult and hardest experience of my life, but they benefited from it in some way, um, which is, you know, not what people say about the side effects they experience from, from SSRIs. So overall, I, you know, want to emphasize that, um, you know, these drugs can be dangerous and they should be taken uh, under, you know, with, in a way that, that is responsible and that you, you know, you know what you're doing or you're with somebody who knows what they're doing or, you know, in a ceremonial or ritual context. I don't want to say exclusively that people should not take them on their own because there are plenty of people that benefit, you know, that way and they are legal uh, or at least decriminalized in a lot of major cities, um, but they should be taken with caution and, and understanding and it's, you know, especially high dose of these things should not be taken kind of willy nilly or uh, without, you know, a lot of respect. So. Yeah. I, I was wondering, um, I wonder what SSRIs were when they were in this stage as psychedelics are in terms of understanding them, what their, you know, side effects, all these different things that we're seeing now in them were like a lot of times it, it a lot of times with FDA or what, ha, what have you, sometimes it, it is like they kind of catch those problems afterwards, you know, when they're in the populations and you really, you know, can, can see or and tailor accordingly. So I, I wonder, you know, if it, you know, if they were in a similar situation, like really, you know, being cautious and being safe is heavily warranted if they were, you know, weighted similarly, you know, one in 10 in the population so that they were studying at the time. I wonder what, like, uh, if anyone's ever done that parallel, it would be, you know, be really kind of an interesting, uh, just a little look. It doesn't mean that they're correlated, like they're going to have the same effects, but I just think that's kind of interesting, same, similar base structure of side effects, and then, you know, seeing where they can come from from there to so, like, kind of like tamper down expectations because psychedelics kind of seem almost like this miracle thing in terms of this capacity to do some good work uh, for people. And SSRIs have been, you know, over overused, it seems like, uh, in the U.S., like the number one place in the world um, to ever use it. It seems like it's overprescribed, especially with the long-term and sometimes permanent side effects that you were talking about. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyone who's ever done that work, please send it to me. And, you know, if you're interested as well, I'll tag you in it because uh, that seems very interesting. The, what is, just as a quick question, what is amesis? I do not know this word. Uh, amesis is uh, vomiting, basically. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I ayahuasca yeah. in particular, most psychedelics are not associated with GI distress or, or, or vomiting. Um, some, sometimes they are during, you know, an acute intense experience, but ayahuasca is for sure associated with that. Uh, it's, it's quite common with that drug. So it's, you know, not, uh, not really considered an adverse event for, for ayahuasca studies. Yeah. And uh, another clarification question. So for psychosis, for any of the side effects of psych uh, psychedelics, it goes away, like you go back to normal after a period of time. I, I thought I was reading once that uh, there are people who like they can have a psychosis or something like that, and it doesn't like return to normal, like they just kind of like, it gets worse, and it stays that way. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was, uh, what I was suggesting. Um, yeah, so okay. for the most part, it seems that yeah, people um, that that is what happens if, if people have a, you know, a discreet or acute kind of a episode. Uh, it tends to be that w with psychedelics, people tend to go back to normal, but in people that are predisposed, uh, you know, like they have a relative with schizophrenia and they're kind of in uh, that window where psychosis or schizophrenia usually develops, which is late teens, early twenties for uh, men. It can be a little bit later for women. Um, but it, does seem to correlate with people developing schizophrenia, their first, uh, you know, episode uh, or first use of, of a psychedelic drug. Uh, THC seems to also be correlated with this. Um, and um, 
So yeah, it, it, same thing seems to be true for bipolar disorder, but these are all large correlational studies and it could very well be that um, it's just when that people are going to have uh, mm -hmm. those episodes if they're predisposed uh, either way. So it may not be causal, it may just be correlated. It also seems that highly stressful events seem to precipitate people's first manic or, or psychotic episode if they're predisposed. So it could be that the stress of the drug experience is related. Um, but, but again, it's not known at this moment whether or not uh, they really would cause something like that or if they would it just accelerate it or, or, or you know, trigger it in somebody who's predisposed. So a lot more work is going to need to be done there. We don't know for sure that that's the case. There could be a world in 20 years where we're not afraid to give people uh, that have a first degree schizophrenic relative uh, uh, psychedelics. But, you know, we, we just don't know yet. Yeah. And then when you're visiting the Amazon, I, I'm familiar with ethnobotany and that's not what you're, it doesn't sound like that's what you're doing. What is the term? And then what was it like to be in the Amazon looking at people um, like the shaman, I assume it's shaman type people doing this type of work. So what is, is there a term for doing that? It's not ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is like you talk to indigenous Americans or indigenous people to learn what, you know, uh, plants they use for the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical needs. Um, but you're going down there for a research purpose, it sounds like. So then like, what's that term just for fun? And then what was it like actually going down there and doing it? Yeah, so um, so I went down there twice, and I also visited an ibogaine center. And uh, the first time, I just went for um, I mean, kind of research purposes, but I you mm -hmm. know uh, went for my own interest. And I, I worked at the center because I was just an undergrad and couldn't afford to to um, really pay for a retreat. So I kind of did this kind of work exchange program. And so you know, there's no particular title. I was just you know finishing my psychology degree and uh, had just finished my philosophy degree, and I. had actually had a friend who from elementary school who developed a addiction to um, opioids and um, he had been to Western rehab several different times and um, couldn't really get treated, but he went to do ayahuasca at the center as kind of a last ditch effort to get clean. And he was just, the difference was incredible. He, he did end up relapsing um, and it, it takes time for people to work through a lot of the stuff that's, you know, contributing to addictions, but um, the difference between that and the kind of three or four Western rehabs that he went to was just tremendous. He was clean for many, many months and his whole, you know, demeanor and personality were uh, a lot healthier. And so after seeing this, you know, finishing up my psych degree and knowing that there's no really therapeutics that have such effects, I became really interested in it and, you know, signed up to work at this place. And, um, and yeah, it was, it, it was really interesting. Um, uh, you know, it's, I went to Quito's Peru, uh, originally to the Hummingbird Retreat Center and later to the Temple of the Way of Light uh, in 2019, which is the, the most recent time I went, which was uh, also for similar reasons, but a, a little more research oriented. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, at the first place I went, um, I worked with, uh, you know, some uh, healers or they call them curanderos or ayahuascaros um, from the Shipibo tribe and um, which is kind of indigenous to the region, uh, region around uh, in the upper Amazon, Pucolpa and, and Iquitos, that area. Um, and then uh, also some kind of syncretic uh, religious traditions where people had kind of integrated Catholicism and a bunch of other uh, kind of uh, traditional practices used in the Amazon from, you know, diverse different tribal groups um, into the way that they uh, practiced uh, with ayahuasca. Um, so yeah, the, I, yeah, I worked with uh, two different um, healers or, you know, shamans or, or, you know, whatever the, the language people prefer is, um, at, at that at that center, and it was really interesting to see the different ways that they worked with uh, with the medicine and interacted with the with the participants and stuff like that. Um, it was yeah, it was honestly really fascinating. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And then um, at the second time I went, uh, you know, four years ago, um, I worked exclusively uh, with the Shipibo tribe, and um, and it was like a you know, since it was a Shipibo center, um, and it's like one of the larger, more prestigious ayahuasca centers in, in Iquitos, um, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was quite a different experience. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they, it was, it was really fascinating. I mean, one, one of the interesting things, uh, is that they, they sing these songs called Icaros, which they actually attribute a lot of the healing or, uh, you know, medicinal effects, uh, of, the experience to, um, to those songs in particular. And, and they, they make these beautiful kind of, um, uh, 
like blankets or tapestries. And in a, in a lot of cases, they um, kind of symbolize their particular songs on, you know, visually in those in those tapestries and and stuff like that. So it's 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 really interesting the way that they approach ayahuasca is not uh, particularly a drug effect or a therapeutic effect of the uh, plants. Um, but uh, instead, they, they it's this whole uh, kind of ceremonial and uh, re like retreat kind of experience. Uh, and, you know, of course, these centers are not exactly how ayahuasca was traditionally used in the Shipibo tribe or any tribe. I mean, there are at least 100 different ayahuasca using groups in the upper Amazon. They all have different, at least 50 different names for ayahuasca. Um, so, you know, now over the past 40 or 50 years, it's kind of transformed, uh, you know, from something that they use or, or the healers use particularly, or people in the tribes use or the healers use on them when they're sick, um, or even to like for spiritual reasons or for hunting or to settle inter interpersonal disputes, it's kind of transformed into this thing that's um, kind of this outward facing uh, programs for Westerners or, or, you know, other people from the area to come in and, um, you know, get healing or, or kind of interact with them in ways that, uh, you know, are psychotherapeutic or whatever. But, but the frame that they use is that, you know, this drug or this this, these plants, they, they have this like spiritual connection to the plants where they speak to them and interact with them in these really beautiful ways. Um, they think that these plants help people open up to the healing, um, which, you know, for them is, is, is interpersonal and, and community oriented uh, in, in a lot of ways, rather than kind of just individually oriented, like a lot of the kind of psychedelic uh, clinical trials that are, that are currently ongoing that really do focus on uh, the drug effects, but, you know, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So interactions between therapy and the drugs, but, um, you know, studies in the U S are typically not, uh, community oriented and you don't have somebody singing to you throughout the experience and having this very personalized kind of spiritual or, um, you know, directed kind of experience. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a very different tradition. And a lot of those traditions are probably for, for good reasons, not being kind of brought into psychedelic clinical trials here, but, um, but it was, it was very profound to see the way that it's practiced there. And, uh, you know, I, I drank with them and, uh, as it was part of, part of my retreat and that, I mean, of course, ayahuasca itself was a profound and experience for me. And, you know, one of, I mean, definitely, you know, top five most important experiences of my life for sure. Um, but yeah, you, I want to really, the, the purpose, I want to emphasize that, um, yeah, there's a bunch of different ways to use uh, psychedelics and ayahuasca. And um, yeah, it was really cool to be able to see see them used in the traditional context and understand the way that they think about causation and in terms of uh, producing healing, um, rather than uh, the just kind of very discreet or, or you know, mechanistic way that, that we understand it as a pharmacological effect or as this, you know, interaction between pharmacology and, and like a psychotherapy. Do if if they're correct, I would think if they're correct and they're thinking that it's the community, the whole effect of you know the songs, the the place, everything coming together, there that gets the result that the desired result. I would I would think then that the very emaciated, very focused clinical trials that are happening in America would have less of effect. You know, if they were correct, like just as a as a thought. So then, is that does that prove out in the science when we're doing these clinical trials? do the ones in America not have the same power in terms of like the, the effects as that people generally see when they're um, doing these type, not retreats, but doing them with these type of community minded places. So that's a very difficult question um, to ask mm -hmm. because um, the, we don't really have apples to apples comparisons. Um, there haven't been a ton of, you know, real placebo controlled clinical trial, or I don't want to say real, there's, there's plenty of benefit to studying these retreat centers. And there's been amazing work done uh, at these retreat centers, or even in ayahuasca churches, like the Santo Daime or Unidad de Vegetal. Um, hopefully I pronounced those correctly, probably not, but, um, but th there's huge benefit, um, but it's really hard to compare or very difficult to compare um, studies that were done in a retreat center and the effect sizes that they see on, you know, psychotherapeutic outcomes or, you know, on psychopathology or even, you know, other peripheral disorders and like what we see in clinical trials um, because the populations are very different. Um, the populations for people going to retreat centers um, are self-selected for people that are willing to go, you know, fly across the world and go through this kind of, there's aspects of the retreat that are difficult other than just ayahuasca. These people are highly motivated. Um, 
Whereas people in clinical trials may also be highly motivated, but it's a totally different um, circumstance. And so, I mean, a lot of the studies that have been performed in kind of more traditional or at retreat centers or with these churches have shown really uh, profound effect sizes. Um, but the effect sizes here in psilocybin trials and stuff um, have also been uh, fairly large for the most part. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a um, important mechanistic effect of, uh, you know, their kind of pomp and circumstance and the kind of Icaros, the singing, the community interactions and stuff like that. Uh, I just think that there are probably independent effects and interacting effects of, of all of these different um, modalities. Uh, it, it, I, I do think uh, that there are this physiological and molecular effects of psychedelics. And I, I think that um, a lot of the effects may be experience dependent, such that if you can, they may be right, that uh, if you can kind of induce metaplasticity or induce um you know, certain forms of, uh, you know, opening up of the brain to, you know, be able to adapt or change in, in, in relation to one's uh, pathology or psychiatric disorder or whatever someone's working on. Um, that may be, you know, mediated by the drugs, but the therapy afterwards uh, that that we do, the integration work and the personal work that individuals do, that may be crucial for directing that plasticity in a way that is actually mm. therapeutic. Um, and some people or people with certain conditions may respond uh, really well to individual one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy, uh, you know, depending on what their the causes and the, the mechanisms kind of under underpinning their, you know, circumstances are, whereas other people may be, you know, more, uh, you know, apt to benefit from kind of community uh, and ritual and ceremony and Icaros and the whole kind of ayahuasca um, kind of uh you know, cultural milieu, uh, or, you know, some people maybe, you know, prefer working with the ayahuasca churches. And I, I do think that, you know, uh, psychiatric disorders and their causes uh, are, you know, there may be kind of molecular things or neurotransmitter things or plasticity related things that are, that we can kind of see between them. But, um, you know, one person's depression may have different causes than another person's depression. And if somebody has, if their depression is driven by inflammation, a you know, anti-inflammatory may be an effective therapeutic, uh, but, you know, a lot of people, their depression is driven by sociocultural factors or socioeconomic factors or personal life stresses or childhood, you know, developmental stressors and things like that. So I think that what we're really doing is we're learning about this new toolkit that we have um, of kind of pharmacologically or botanically enhanced um, uh, either psychotherapy or, or just at least some kind of um, uh, actual interactive um, kind of therapy or, or community-based therapy. Um, and I, yeah, so I, I think there were, we have this new pharmacological or botanical toolkit, and we also uh, are just kind of beginning to understand the importance of um, kind of exp the experiential experiential component in uh, kind of directing where that where that plasticity uh, and adaptation kind of kind of grows. So um, yeah, th I think you may be right. Uh, I, no analyses directly like that have been um, performed as far as I know. Um, and mostly because it would be really hard to meta analyze studies mm -hmm. that are so different. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I think that might kind of be right, but it, there also may be reasons why, um, you know, the therapeutic effects experienced by people in clinical trials or in different modalities may, they're just as valid and important. Just mm -hmm. that they're, they're different. Yeah. From the traditional side, is there anything there that when psychedelics have been proven out, the research has been done, that you would um that you'd want to test out to see if it's something that can be integrated into psychedelic the like the clinical side of psychedelics? Is there like something about the process, the procedure of of how we currently are doing it now in a clinical the US way, let's call it like the West way of doing it, versus traditional? Is there anything there in the process that you think like there might be something there that you'd want to research to then potentially integrate into the, the procedure process of using psychedelics? Yes, absolutely. Um, so currently in designing this uh, study that we're uh, to translate my you know preclinical pharmacological study into human clinical trial, um, you know, we're wondering which, which music that, that we should use. And uh, that, you know, musical element, I think is uh, probably quite important. Um, you know, it's unclear exactly mechanistically why and how it's important, but we know that music uh, impacts our mood and our affect and, um, you know, affect and mood are, you know, 
potentially driven largely by metabolic factors or at least areas of the brain that, that monitor, um, you know, our energy utilization and demands and production. Um, and, you know, a lot of these regions are impacted uh, by psychedelics and they all, they're also impacted by, you know, our, um, you know, by what's going on in the environment, our, our, you know, what our set, you know, what we bring into, to the picture and, and, you know, the setting that, you know, including the music and the environment that we're in. So there could very well be a, an important interaction there to where, you know, the type of music um, or the type of kind of environment or set, uh, you know, really makes a big difference for people. And there's a cool paper published um, by Fred Barrett and um, some other, I believe Fred was on that paper, but um, some people at uh, some researchers at Johns Hopkins um, where they actually use two different kinds of music um, Actually, I think it was Matt Johnson's study, to be honest, um, but uh, in, in a smoking cessation uh, trial of psilocybin. And they did, uh, you know, seem to see some it was a small study, so it wasn't really powered to show really robust, statistically significant differences. But there may be differences between the types of music that people use and, and how effective uh, the therapy is. Um, so, so, yeah, that, that's one thing music particularly how it impacts affect and how you know our affective state um may be one of those important contexts that kind of you know um steers that plasticity in directions that are therapeutic if somebody's in a having a very positive mood and the brain's very plastic um you know perhaps that can you know help facilitate them uh, working through some psychological content or or something like that that um is important for their you know recovery or you know healing or or, or whatever the case may be and the other thing is the community aspect of it and um, group therapy. So my PI, Josh Woolley, actually did an amazing study with psilocybin on um, people with, uh, you know, uh, HIV or chronic HIV diagnoses. And uh, they, they were able to take, they had to take the psychedelic with a one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, or I think it was them and, and uh, a, a dyad, a male-female therapist team, I believe at the time. But um, but then the, everything else, all the integration was was group therapy integration. And I think that's, it, it, you know, it's just a small study to begin. But I think that's another angle that may be really important, especially for people, you know, working through uh, interpersonal uh, situations or, or people, you know, for whom, um, you know, connection and, and, and group work would be really important. So yeah, I think those are, those are really two, two important things I'd be interested in. Yeah. The music one in particular makes a lot of sense to me. I was reading somewhere that some of the first songs, the first songs are really based on the human heart. And I've had people on who have talked about this at length, but the heart and the brain, whatever happens to the heart happens to the brain. And so this idea that we could be playing something that's, you know, based on a heartbeat, like all music kind of just affects the heart, which then affects the brain. And then you have these psychiatric disorders. I think that's that. That feels like there probably is something like you could probably like isolate it down in, a, in a, an experiment and probably see something there that does feel. I, I agree that that'd be really interesting to see if music's a part of it and like to what extent and why. That'd be really funny, like not funny, but a really fun thing to go down. Um, what? What? Um, so it seems that like each psychedelic has its own speciality in terms of like what it can do for the brain. What made you, and it might have just been like your PhD and like whatever, how things worked out, but what made you choose ayahuasca to like really focus down on versus like psilocybin or some of these other things? Like what, what, not just about it, but like, what about its effect on people that really got you interested in it in this way that you like spend years working on it? <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And I, um, I think that's probably going to end up being the case. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a ton of, um, uh, like specific evidence differentiating mm -hmm. the different psychedelics in terms of their therapeutic potential. There's some preclinical evidence that suggests that different chemotypes or different classes have different effects or different individual drugs. Um, but yeah, my intuition is, is that we will probably, uh, you know, eventually, you know, kind of uh, understand this toolkit more and, and know, you know, what, what drugs are more effective for um, which conditions, um, particularly with DMT. I mean, there are uh, really two reasons. There was a um, investigator, uh, Dr. Steve Barker, who was one of my kind of core mentors when I started graduate school, um, who had been doing research on endogenous DMT um, since, uh, you know, the eighties, uh, you know, he had, he had worked at, at UAB with Humphrey Osmond, uh, one of the kind of big, uh, original um, kind of psychedelic researchers. Uh, he was a kind of British um, 
MD who actually was the first person to give mescaline to Aldous Huxley. And uh, since you know, Dr. Parker uh, spent most of his time working on uh, endogenous DMT and also the metabolism of ayahuasca, that was uh, you know, one, one main reason his influence. Uh, also, DMT is particularly interesting because it, it is an endogenous compound, uh, whether or not it produces uh, kind of near-death experiences and things like that uh, is is more um, speculative. Yeah, one of the things that really interested me about DMT was that it is endogenous, so it's produced uh, in um, the body in, in mammals. Uh, we, we've seen that in rats and mice, and uh, it has been measured peripherally in humans, although it's very difficult to do so, and there's some skepticism about that. Um, but but yeah, because it's very similar structurally to endogenous neurotransmitters, it's produced um, and it's also metabolized much like uh, an endogenous neurotransmitter. Um, so it's, it's got a very short half-life and a, a very, um, uh, you know, quick, um, you know, onset. And so because of this, it's a very um, kind of clean um, experience. Like it, it uh, you know, the experience happens fast and it wears off very quickly, um, which, you know, could have important therapeutic potential. And the fact that it's just, you know, it's in so many plant species, hundreds, if not, you know, thousands uh, around the world. And there are lots of different ways to make ayahuasca from a lot of these different plants or ayahuasca like um, kind of combinations that are that are psychoactive. Um, and then, you know, the, the, you know, Peruvian traditions and, uh, you know, Brazilian traditions all over the upper Amazon. Uh, people have been using this for probably hundreds of years, if not longer. And then, of course, the experience with my my friend, um, kind of seeing him uh, improve so much. So, so yeah, it, it, DMT and ayahuasca really uh, was a convergence of a lot of my individual interest. I was also interested in ethnobotany and, um, you know, I wanted to do that kind of uh, scientific expedition to the jungle. And yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot, a lot of different reasons. Um, some of them mechanistic, some of them, um, you know, just the circumstances. Um, and yeah, I forgot to mention one of the, the last reasons is that I was interested in metabolism and oxidative stress and inflammation. And um, DMT also binds to a receptor called sigma one, which may be uh, you know cellular protective and and have have its own benefits in addition to the serotonin receptor. So that was another reason, you know, looking at oxidative stress and inflammation that I was particularly interested in DMT. Of the psychedelics. Are there ones that have particularly low risk as it comes to psych, uh, side effects or however you want to categorize risk and some that have more high risk? Um, I, for the classic psychedelics like LSD, mescaline, mm -hmm. DMT, uh, psilocybin, I don't think we really know whether or not some have are more risky than others. I think psilocybin has been consumed the most by the largest number of people and it's been the most studied. So if you were to bet on one, you'd probably bet on that one, but I don't think that we have real uh, strong empirical data that that's the case. Um, they all seem to be extremely safe for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the other kind of, um, you know, more experimental psychedelics or ones that haven't been studied as much, uh, those, you know, may be riskier, particularly MDMA and Ibogaine uh, and particularly Ibogaine may be, um, uh, you know, particularly risky. We know that there is a, um, you know, fairly high, uh, not, not, I wouldn't say fairly high, but there is a significant chance of cardiovascular events with Ibogaine. Uh, MDMA is also, um, you know, it, it's a stimulant and increases, uh, you know, catecholamines and it, it, because it's a stimulant and not just a serotonin 2A or serotonin receptor agonist, it does, you know, it can also produce, um, you know, higher rates of side effects. So, but for the classical psychedelics, I, I am not aware of any evidence suggesting that any of them are safer than others. Hmm. If you were to, I, I guess this would be unfair to ask a scientist, but I was, I would ask you, like, if you were to guess which one's the safest, I imagine you'd probably like go with the ayahuasca or something because then you're putting so much time into it, but it's unfair to ask a scientist to guess this. So I will not ask it of you. The, uh, what are some books? Scientists won't do it. Go, go, go and ask a scientist to make a guess. They won't do it. The, they like to qualify things. What are some books you recommend people check out, either in this space or in general? It'd be really cool if it was in this space. I'm always trying to learn more and read more. I read The Immortality Key that talks about like the ancient you know, psychedelics, which is pretty cool. Uh, but uh, what are some books that you recommend? Yeah, I mean, that that's a really good one. I would definitely recommend uh, The Immortality Key by uh, Brian Murescu. Um, Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. It's fascinating. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, um, there's a book that he references there a lot called, uh, the road to Eleusis. Um, mm. 
that book's uh, pretty cool just for, you know, more background reading in, in that uh, topic. Um, with regards to um, other psychedelics or, you know, let's see. I mean, you know, just obviously in pop culture, um, how to change your mind is, is, you know, yeah. really big Michael Pollan's book, uh, which I thought was, was good, but kind of like, uh, fairly basic, um, in regards to, you know, psychedelic integration and like working with, uh, th these medicines, um, there's a book called psychedelic integration. That's, uh, really good. Um, I, I would definitely recommend that. Um, you know, particularly for DMT, there's DMT, the spirit molecule, which was a write up from Rick Strassman of the uh, kind of first study on psychedelics that was done since prohibition started. That was done in, in the early 90s. Um, that's pretty cool. Just in terms of he's got all these awesome um, kind of trip reports in there of, of what happened when he gave people injections of DMT. And those are uh, fascinating, uh, although it's kind of an older, older book. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, I think that pretty pretty good pretty good suggestions. Um, I mean, of course, like there's the classic ones, Doors of Perception uh, by Aldous Huxley uh, from you know, and there, Alan Watts also wrote one called The Joyous Cosmolo Cosmology from the same time period where he describes these kind of early experiences. I think those are really cool because they were there was no kind of uh, psychedelic zeitgeist at that time. Like these were kind of philosophers or you know literary people that were just writing about their experiences. So it's cool to see those without the filter of all the Hmm. the scientific culture um so yeah i think those are, those are definitely great places to start will you uh write a book you know on ayahuasca in general yeah perhaps i mean at, at the moment all my time is taken up writing papers hmm. and trying to get a faculty job um but yeah that, that that's definitely uh something i've i've thought about yeah well if, if you do or if you need a beta reader i will read it and i'll give you my feedback but i have heard of alan watts a few times uh, is he worth reading? Like, what is he about? I, I just, I hear him a lot. I hear his name a lot, but I haven't like looked into him. Yeah. Alan, Alan Watts is great. I would say he's a, uh, I mean, he was um, not really an academic philosopher. He was originally an Anglican priest who was interested in um, kind of Eastern religion. Uh, and he spent some time working at his Zen monastery and, um, but, but really his, his shtick is, is um, comparative religion. Um, and, as an Anglican priest, he was very good at translating a lot of these ideas from Buddhism and Hinduism um, into the language of Western religion and Western science. I and mean, he was a brilliant man and an incredibly clear thinker, I think, for his time, uh, especially considering the material he was working on. So uh, if you're interested in, in Eastern religion or, or comparative religion or meditation and things like that, he's like, I would say he's like the best place to start because he's really good at, at, you know, taking these big ideas and you know, putting them into um, a framework that's easy for at least Westerners to understand. Um, so he was, you know, I, I studied, you know, some Eastern religion and philosophy and stuff like that. And he was always a great, a great resource. So I think he's, he's great. He, was, he wasn't really a psychonaut particularly, although he did uh, take, you know, psychedelics several times in, uh, in the, I think, late fifties and early sixties. Um, in, in, as part of different studies and things like that. And he was extremely good at articulating um, the similarity of the psychedelic state to a uh, mystical experience. And as some of the listeners might know, um, the Hopkins group, especially Bill Richards has, uh, and uh, Griffiths have done a lot of work and showing that the psychedelic experience is very similar to mystical experiences that um, are produced kind of on the natural without drugs. And uh, also Tim Leary did, did some of this work back in the day um, with, uh, you know, in, in comparing these sorts of things. Um, so, so yeah, I think Watts is a, uh, yeah, I would highly recommend him if you're interested in that stuff, but he's not really a, you know, a drug researcher type guy, but he's, yeah, mm. I think books, uh, the, um, what's it called? The book on the taboo against knowing who you are, I think is a pretty good one. Um, just to summarize all his work and also the wisdom of insecurity was, was really helpful for me. Yeah. And then, uh, I know you studied philosophy and so this kind of is like good transition, The I was reading this book on the meditations and it was like a translation they had in the beginning which i really enjoyed it started by explaining how philosophy meant something different back then philosophy back then was more like like how self-help books are now it's more like understanding the world and how you fit into it and like and, and in that way versus where like 
up until I don't know, like the eighteen, the nineteen hundreds, whatever. Philosophy is more like this, like how do things work? How does the mind work? Dualism, stuff like that, which is different. But it went from being like kind of like self help, like how do you deal with trauma and all these other things, to like something more like that. What it? So you, you studied philosophy. I haven't really you know read anything about Heidegger, for instance, but the what is modern philosophy about like what are they what what problems do they are they tend to chewing on are, are philosophers now chewing on yeah that's a that's a great great question and uh yeah it's interesting that you point out that transition that's occurred um so there's really two schools uh well there's more but essentially there's two schools of philosophical thought that kind of uh, generally persist today. There's continental philosophy, like you mentioned Heidegger. Uh, these are uh, also include people like John Paul Sartre and Camus and um, Kierkegaard and, you know, uh, people, the existentialist and phenomenologist uh, from Europe. Um, and then there's uh, empirical philosophy uh, or um, yeah, basically analytical philosophy um, which focuses more on the problems that, you know, you're talking about. So most f people, philosophers of mind, uh, you know, logicians, uh, people that are, you know, trying to solve particular discrete problems using abstract logic and things like that. These are mostly analytical philosophers. Um, so, you know, there's still, uh, there's, you know, now, now a lot of people, uh, like some of my mentors at LSU, John Cogburn, are trying to kind of synthesize these two traditions. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's really cool and fantastic. But um, but yeah, I think, you know, a lot of the uh, kind of analytical philosophers are focusing on, you know, problems of language and philosophy of mind and, you know, looking at, you know, things kind of like a scientist would look at them, um, but from a philosophical orientation. I think Alan Watts said that analytical philosophers would wear a white lab coat if they could. Uh, and I don't mean that as a criticism. There's I, analytical philosophy is super cool. And um, but yeah, they're more, um, you know, rigorous in, in certain ways, whereas continental philosophers, uh, they come from different tradition and emphasize things like phenomenology and, um, you know, more of these ex existential questions uh, that, that you were talking about before, um, but in different ways than um, the ancients or the moderns did like Descartes. Um, so, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so, yeah, there's really these two kind of traditions. And um, I think the coolest work is people that are kind of synthesizing. There's also postmodernism. Uh, I didn't want to go into too much detail, but it, it, things have kind of changed besides those two distinctions, but that's uh, kind of a brief summary. Well, yeah, I feel like we're in a time period where like everything has boring labels like postmodernism or post postmodernism. So it's just, I just feel like it should be modern and then we should have like new set, new uh, categories, but I don't name these things. But if you were, um, if you were, if you, if you had to just study philosophy, is there like a, a vein or a thought that you would chew on that you would think about that you'd work through? Um, yeah, I mean, I was particularly interested in philosophy of mind and, um, mm. but the reason, um, you know, I was interested in problem of consciousness and, um, you know, particularly I was interested in the problem or the problem, but the self and, uh, you know, representation and identity. Um, and that, you know, one of these things that spans really um, continental and analytic philosophy. Um, but I, I found that I just really didn't have the um, ability to dig into the literature of act, you know, how the brain functions and, you know, what things do we know about the brain regions and, and networks that mediate these effects to really, you know, fully utilize my philosophical education. So that's why I went into psychology and then mm -hmm. I, medicine and, and biomedicine and things like that, um, neuroscience to, to try to get that understanding. But um, yeah, so I kind of started very abstract and, and dug down into the science and, you know, hopefully my career arcs back up and, and one day I can, you know, write, write about these things again. But um, yeah, in, in, in one way, I'm still kind of doing that. It's just, I, I felt like I, I needed, um, yeah, I needed other other tools and ideas to be able to really uh, understand what what I hope to. Yeah, the uh, I think this will probably be our last question. What um, I, I read once that when people die, there's like a, a weight difference. Like immediately when people die, there's like like a hundred grams or whatever. And people theorize like that maybe that's the soul leaving the body. Like like Descartes was right. Like there's a there's a self and there's like an ethereal self or whatever the the term he used. But um, if if you were a betting man. Uh, what do you think is the difference between like the physical, you know, the cells of a, of a body and the self is, do you think they're separate? I guess, I guess we're, I'm just asking about Descartes and your opinion on his, his thoughts, but uh, if, what are your thoughts on the self as it relates to the physical versus like, I don't know, the spiritual, or the mental? 
Wow. That's uh, so I know I've said you've had good questions a lot of times, but that is a perfect question to, to conclude with because uh, it really summarizes everything. Um, so um, from uh, when I'm wearing my kind of um, uh, scientist, uh, you know, mitochondrial psychobiology hat, um, I think the clearest answer that's probably understandable to everyone uh, as the difference between a dead body and a living organism is energy flow. Um, mm. uh, that's really the difference. There's not, uh, at least immediately at the moment of death, there's not major molecular or physiological differences uh, other than, you know, those events that, 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 you know, correlate with death. Um, but what really happens is that there's no longer uh, energy flow through the organism. So the mitochondria and, and other, you know, glycolysis, these other mechanisms cease. And so cells die because they don't have energy flowing through them. And that's really the case with all of, of nature, right? Things that are alive have energy flowing through them and that, um, you know, allows them to act and participate in the world. Um, uh, as you know, as for my orientation to religion and spirituality, um, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know, uh, to be honest. Um, mm. and you know, I've had experiences on, uh, ayahuasca and, and um, ibogaine and, and things like that, that have opened me up to the possibility that there may be, um, more than just our, um, you know, current, scientific understanding of, of what's going on in the universe. Um, and, you know, I'm open to the possibility that, that there are, is a soul or, you know, some kind of, you know, mediator of that energy flow or something like that. Um, and, you know, I, I first did ayahuasca. I was a kind of uh, God delusion thumping atheist I was reading Dawkins and uh, I was also reading Alan Watts and, and people like that. So I was curious, but, um, but yeah, it was after those experiences that I became more open to the possibility that there was more than my, you know, our scientific understanding of, of these things. But, um, but yeah, now I kind of, um, and I, I probably moved toward that direction, um, more than 50% after those experiences. But, um, but now I kind of sit in a, in a position of, um, I don't want to say uncertainty, but just openness or, or uh, to whatever the, po the the reality may be. I think it's just as um, fantastic and amazing if 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 you know if if it is just you know energy flow through an organism that animates us um, because I mean, it's amazing that that we can have these sorts of experiences um, you know through biological mechanisms and, you know, the experiences you have on ayahuasca are so profound. It's amazing that that could be produced by your nervous system. I mean, in certain cases, you'll see more art in 10 minutes uh, during that period that is just so profound than, than in all of the halls of, of art museums all over the world. Um, you know, so it's amazing that each of us perhaps have that uh, inner artist and inner, you know, capacity to, to have these profound experiences. But it's also quite possible that there's, uh, you know, there's something else going on, but um, it's very difficult to know to know what mm -hmm. that is. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say about this is you mentioned Descartes. Um, so the endogenous DMT uh, idea actually came uh, the way it's been framed uh, after it was discovered actually came from uh, Descartes. So, um, so Descartes believed that the way that the soul interacted with the body was through the pineal gland. And um, for a long time, it was hypothesized uh, by Rick Strassman and, and um, one of my mentors, Steve Barker, that the pineal gland may be the site of endogenous TMT production. And it created this whole um, kind of, um, I don't know what you would call it, like a mythology or a, uh, mm. you know, folk, folk understanding or folk wisdom of, of, you know, confirming D Descartes' intuitions on this. Um, and it does seem like DMT is produced in the brain, although uh, recent work that came out uh, from Dr. Barker and, and Gimo Borgesian and John Dean at, at Michigan uh, suggests that the pineal gland may not, not actually be uh, the site of DMT synthesis. They, they were able to find more in the visual cortex and removing the pineal gland didn't change the amount of DMT that was produced very much. And so, um, so yeah, it, it, you know, it may or may not be the case that DMT that our body produces mediates uh, kind of spiritual or near death experiences or things like this. It, it could very well be the case, but it, it may not be. And uh, Dave Nichols and Chuck Nichols have written some really great work criticizing this. Um, but it, it does seem that it's produced and it does seem that, you know, near death or during cardiac arrest, uh, production of DMT is increased. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and the pineal gland is an interesting organ, but it doesn't seem to, to come from there. So uh, I think that's kind of illustrative of um, the fact that we really don't 
we really don't know. Sometimes we have mythologies or we have uh, ideas about what's going on or, or where these experiences come from or the mechanistic means by which we have experiences and things like that. But biology and, and really reality seems to always uh, escape our um, uh, investigations. And, and I really do think that, that the mystery, as uh, Brian Marescu uh, says in, in, in The Immortality Key, is, is, is really the the most amazing um, place you can really stand in relation to spirituality and um, our this very weird thing that's going on uh, with us being here, human beings on this planet, doing podcasts and stuff. So, um, so yeah, that's I, 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 yeah, that's that's kind of where I where I am. <laughs>